Our topic today is type 1 hypersensitivity. Two common examples of type 1 hypersensitivity reactions include food allergies and allergic rhinosinusitis. Let's begin by talking about food allergies. The exact prevalence rate for food allergies is unknown, but in the United States, food allergies are believed to affect 4% of children and 1% of adults. Most any food can produce an allergic response, but did you know that 97% of food-related allergies are due to just eight foods? Of the foods shown, can you guess which eight they are? If you answered tree-grown nuts, milk, peanuts, soy, peas, eggs, seafood or shellfish, and wheat, then you are correct. Out of the eight most common allergy-causing food, three foods are most likely to cause anaphylaxis, which is a whole-body, life-threatening allergic response. These include tree-grown nuts, seafood or shellfish, and peanuts. It is estimated that in the U.S., 200 people die each year due to severe allergic responses to food. It is also estimated that 1% of Americans are specifically allergic to peanuts. And peanut allergy is the leading cause of death due to anaphylaxis. Interestingly, most individuals who experience milk, egg, wheat, and soy allergies as children can develop tolerance to these foods later in life. But those with allergies to peanuts, tree-grown nuts, and seafood or shellfish often remain allergic to these foods throughout life. As mentioned, allergic rhinosinusitis is also a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Common respiratory allergens include pollen, fungal spores, feces of house dust mites, and animal dander. Exposure to these may lead to allergic sinusitis in susceptible individuals. Animal dander refers to the microscopic particles of skin or fur shed from animals including cats and dogs. People who are allergic to mice or gerbils are not actually allergic to the dander, but to some of the urine components in the animal cages. In certain individuals, inhaled allergens may cause allergic rhinosinusitis. Now for the mechanism of a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. The process begins as an allergen, such as pollen, is inhaled into the respiratory system and is processed by an antigen-presenting cell, or APC. The APC presents a portion of the pollen to a naive T helper cell. At this point, the APC also releases the cytokine IL-4 onto the T helper cell, which causes the naive T helper cell to differentiate into a T helper 2 or TH2 cell. A B cell also presents a portion of the pollen to a T helper 2 cell. The T helper 2 cell then releases IL-4, which activates a class switch of the B cell to cause it to become a plasma cell that produces IgE antibodies. The released IgE antibodies bind to FC receptors located on mast cells and basophils. On subsequent exposure to the allergen, the allergen binds to two separate IgE antibodies on the mast cells or basophils. This is known as cross-linking and causes degranulation that releases inflammatory mediators, including histamine. This brings about a primary hypersensitivity reaction or early response that includes vasodilation, bronchoconstriction, and endothelial retraction, which brings about edema. This early response begins within five to 30 minutes and subsides after about an hour. The T helper two cell also releases IL-13, which causes epithelial cells to produce mucus. A secondary reaction begins within two to seven hours and may last for days. This late reaction involves the recruitment and activation of leukocytes, like eosinophils, 
as the T helper 2 cells release IL-3 and IL-5, and as mast cells release eosinophil chemotactic factor. Eosinophils can be destructive to tissues and cause cell damage. Lipid mediators produced from arachidonic acid are also a significant part of the late response and include prostaglandins and leukotrienes that have similar effects as histamine. Leukotrienes are particularly potent bronchoconstrictors. Now for some questions to assess your understanding. Pause the video now and think of your answers. If you answered the following, you are correct. Thanks for watching.